Man, it's good to be here with you guys. I'm looking forward to the week. Uh, I speak in front of thousands of people. It might be more intimidating speaking in front of young people now. I'm looking forward to the time. And here, here's one of the reasons I'm so burdened for you guys. And I, I teach and train. I have several teenagers in my house right now. And I teach and train these guys to say, listen, if you believe some of the things that I believe from God's word, if you teach some of the things that I teach to be true from God's word, which will be enduring forever, there's a chance that you're going to spend some time away from your family, possibly even put away in jail. What we're going to see, I think, in the next several years in your lifetime is there's going to need to be a commitment that's surpassed what we've seen in recent history in the United States of America. And what we're going to see is we're going to need to see a generation like your generation that will stand up and be anchored to Christ the Savior. What I want to speak to you about this morning is from Hebrews 6, 19. So turn in your Bibles to Hebrews 6, 19. I want to talk to you on this subject, Christ the sure and steady anchor of the soul. Christ, the sure and steady anchor of the soul. Now, as you're turning there, I want us to talk about and give the context for, for the life that we're living in right now. And, and this shouldn't shock us because the Bible makes very clear the climate that we will live in. We, we've been sort of lulled to sleep by the peace that we've experienced. But the Bible describes a life of turmoil, a life of difficulty, a life of struggle, particularly for those who believe, but really for everyone who lives in the world that is cursed by sin. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 7, he's closing out the Sermon on the Mount. And when he's closing out this sermon, he gives a context. He's describing this idea, which he says in other places, in this world, you will have trouble. Matthew 7, he closes out, and this is what he says, everyone then who hears the wor these words of mine and does, not, uh, and does them will uh, be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, I want you to notice what's coming. And, and this is the same as whether you hear the words of God or not, this is a part of the life of what it means to live in a cursed world. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and be on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. The critical thing that I want to communicate to you this morning is life has normal difficulties. To walk through difficulties and storms and trials and problems, torrents of storms and problems and difficulties is normal in life. In 1904, there was a man by the name of G. Stanley Hall. His name is not all that important, but he wrote a two-volume work where he coined the term adolescence. And the way in which he chose to describe this term adolescence was this way. He said, the life that is like storm and stress, it's full of storm and stress. What he was trying to describe is, is your age. He started with this age from 12 to 14, and he said something happens. He was, he was looking at life from really an evolutionary perspective. And he said something happens in this age, 12 to 14, where there's lots of storm and stress, as if this was something abnormal and unusual. But what he predicted, he predicted that what would need to happen in order for man to advance to whatever was next in the evolutionary chain is that Life would need to be extended to such a degree that storm and stress would ex expand over a longer period of time. What's interesting in, is that in the last 100 years, that's actually come true. Because what we see now is, is this term adolescence is describing in G. Stanley Hall's mind 120 years ago, it's describing a very short period of time, 12 to 14. Lots of difficulty, you're you're understanding life, making decisions and choices, maybe for the first time. You're, you're not a child any longer. You're starting to experience life on your own, take responsibility for yourself and your actions, make some decisions. And he predicted that in order for, for man in an evolutionary perspective to continue to progress, that, that time needed to extend. 
One of the primary things that you're facing in your generation is the extension of that fable, that myth that we call in our culture adolescence, where now we describe even 30-year-olds who sit in the basements of their parents playing video games all day. We have a term for that. We call it adult adolescence. My point is simply this. Life is filled in a normal way with storm and stress and difficulty, and where you're at in life right now, It's not unusual difficulty. It's a lot of pressure, no question. But it's not unusual difficulty based on what the scripture describes normal life would be like. What's happening to you right now is you're in process of no longer being a child where people take care of you, they make decisions for you. Now you're in process of learning the world for yourself and making some of those decisions for yourself. And some of those decisions are gonna be critical. I mean, let's look at the world that you're facing right now. Normal difficulties in life, Satan's temptations, your own particular corruptions. The the most evil thing in the world is not something out there. The most evil thing in the world is what resides in your own corrupted heart and the ways in which you desire those temptations that are out there. You face all sorts of battles, but even trials from the world. Let's talk about some of those trials. Adam talked about last night that that we're going to be face forward with you because the world doesn't shy away or try to veil what they're communicating to you. I think it's time that we start speaking face forward to you. Think about some of the trials of the world in the last five years. Think about the level of racial tensions in the world, particularly in America. If you live in the cities, it's even worse. You see this in your schools if you go to public school system. What about this question? We have a hard time in our culture. This is unbelievable to me. That we have such a hard time in our culture answering the question, what's a woman? You're being asked that question all the time. And we have people who are standing in our Supreme Court who can't even answer that that question. It feels like the twilight zone, like everything has been turned upside down. The barrage of sexual immorality that you face, and not just now where you are, when you leave where you are now and you go off to college, the barrage of sexual immorality. And here's the thing about our culture. When I was coming through college, it was sort of like, you guys can have your little Christian thing, just tolerate us. Just tolerate what we want, tolerate what we want to pursue, just, just leave us alone, let us have our space, and just tolerate us. That narrative has radically changed. It's changed according to what I think was predicted in Romans chapter 1. Is what they want is not tolerance, they want your approval. And what that means is that the heat is getting turned up in your life, where you can't stand on the fence relative to these issues of sexual preference and sexual identity anymore. What we see is storm and stress and difficulty. We see wind blowing at, at, at uh, ways that we've never experienced before, at least in the modern sense, as it relates to Christianity. The question is, what are you going to do with these pressures? What are you going to hold on to? What are you going to, what are you going to cling to? What's going to hold you steady and sure? What's going to hold you steadfast? Turn over to Hebrews 6, 19. I want to start actually just in a couple of verses before that. Hebrews 6, verse 13, I want to give the context, but we're going to focus primarily on 6, 19, if we can. 6, 19. Verse 13 says, For when God made a promise, I want you to pay attention. This This is a difficult passage. I'm going to try to do my best to explain it very briefly, but I want us to hone in on the amazing truths in verse 19. For when God made a promise to Abraham, so we're talking about something in the past. If you remember, uh, the book of Hebrews uh, is written to those who are Israelites. So what you see throughout the whole of the book is imagery that relates to the old covenant. And what he's doing is he's trying to help us to understand what was unfolding in God's story of history. In God's story from time beginning through the life of the the children of Israel, and God's going to help us to understand something. And and this is what the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is trying to communicate. So he's giving us a picture of something that happened in the life of Abraham. 
since he had no one greater by whom to swear, and he's talking about God, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. He's talking about the time when Abraham went up to the mountain to sacrifice his son. And that he, he demonstrated, Abraham demonstrated by faith his belief in the one true God. That, that even if he were to kill his son, that God would be true to his promise and raise his son from the dead. And so what God is doing is he, he acknowledges Abraham's wonderful and deep faith. And then he goes on and says this, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. What I want to do is I want to start here in Hebrews six nineteen. Look at the first few words of this passage. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Now, what I want to do is I want to break this down a little bit. I don't, I'm not a super wonderful Greek scholar. I'm actually quite terrible at it at times. But in the, in the original language, the way this reads is, is this. We have an anchor of the soul. And then the adjectives come later. The, the expressions of what the, the anchor does or what it accomplishes comes later. So let's put that off to the side for a second. And I just want to make this as the first primary point. We have this anchor of the soul. We have this anchor of the soul. Now, I want to I wanna put it to you sort of like this. Is that life is full of tumult. Life is full of difficulty, the way Charles Spurgeon described this. He says, the world is like a sea, restless, unstable, and dangerous. I remember I grew up in Florida, a uh, wonderful time growing up there, and I had an uncle who had a nice boat, and we would go out and he would take us into the Gulf of Mexico. And as we went out into the Gulf of Mexico, he would take us fishing, trout fishing, not if you live in close to rivers and streams, not that kind of trout, sea trout. And so we were in about four foot of water, and I was sort of a newbie growing up in Florida. I did a lot of freshwater fishing, but never sort of out in the ocean. If you've ever been out in the ocean, it's sort of a terrifying thought. Like you get out there and you can't see a whole lot, nothing but water, right? If something happens to this boat, what are we going to do? And I remember one of the things we, we started doing, it was pretty fun, we would catch little pinfish. They were our bait fish, small little fish. And then we would put those on the hook and we would throw those out. And what I remember is the rod bent. And I started reeling in and my uncle said, man, you're going to love this because you never know what you're going to pull up from the ocean. Okay. And so something had gotten the pinfish. And so here I am, I'm reeling this thing in. <clears throat> and by the time that fish or whatever it was gets to the boat, for some reason, all of a sudden, the, the, the rod is not bent any longer, and I start reeling it in. And when I reel the rod in, what, what I see is like really right behind the gills, everything is gone except the head of the fish on the hook. And it wasn't the pinfish. It was actually the fish that ate the pinfish. And something had, I don't know what, something had destroyed that little fish. And I remember my uncle looking at me and said, he said, son, it's a jungle out there. And I would say that life is a lot like that. I can remember one of the things that we would do when we would, we would drift fish. And if the, if the tide was moving too quickly, we would drop an anchor. The problem is we wouldn't drop a, a normal anchor. The idea was not to, not to really hold us in one place. The idea was to help us to drift. And so we would take weighted balls. And it was only four feet, so we would throw it down. And, and it would not catch. But you could feel the power of the ocean. And when you think about life as being like a jungle or life being like the, the torrents of the ocean and the power of the ocean, the question is, what is the anchor of your soul? What, what's the thing that holds you stable and steady in a world described like that? 
I mean, what, what's your anchor? There are all sorts of things that we cling to in life. There are all sorts of things that we, we lean into in life to try and allow our lives to feel stabilized. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's friends. Sometimes it's dreams. Sometimes it's ambitions. Sometimes it's relationships. Sometimes it's uh, all sorts of things that you can lean into that you hope in in life. Maybe it's what you want to become. The problem with all of that stuff is, is what, what those anchors are made of. I would argue that every single person in this room is designed to have something that anchors you. The problem is, is that we're always chasing after anchors that aren't sure and they're not steady. The question for you, and I want you to wrestle with this question, is genuinely what is it that you are clinging to to hold you steady in a tumultuous world that we live in with the normal difficulties of everyday life? What is it that you're clinging to? Because most anchors that we cling to in life are like your art project in class. Like you create this thing maybe of paper mache or whatever material it is that you're constructing and it, it looks brilliant. It, it looks like the real thing. But you take that out to the ocean, tie it up to a, to a rope, you throw that overboard into the ocean and what happens to that paper mache anchor? It's useless. It can't do the job for which you were hoping it could accomplish no matter how real it looks no matter how sturdy you think it might be, no matter how, what grade you got on that art project, you throw that thing overboard and it dissipates immediately because it can't handle the torment of the ocean. Solomon describes this very thing in the book of Ecclesiastes where he says he starts pursuing all good things, all good things that God had given him under the sun, but he does it without the fear of the Lord. And as he pursues these things, guess what he says? The pursuit of all these things, are, they're vanity. They're nothing. They're like paper mache anchors that, that wither and die when the waters get rough. See, this is the picture. And here's the thing. I'm not trying to tell you to destroy your dreams. I'm not trying to tell you to destroy your ambitions. Some of them are sinful. You need to get rid of them. But for the most part, to pursue dreams and ambitions in and of themselves are not necessarily bad, but they make terrible anchors. You see, what, what you have to understand is even the good things that we pursue, when we make them ultimate, they become wicked things because they become destructive because they were never intended to bear the weight of, of your life. There's only one anchor that can accomplish that. The question for you is, what is your anchor? Let me pause here for a second because there are certainly those who do not believe in Christ in this room. And can I tell you that the things I'm going to say moving forward if you are not in Christ, they don't apply to you. The, the fact of the matter is, is that you will live an unhappy life if what anchors you are your circumstances in life. I want you to compare what, what we're about to talk about is Christ because the, the whole preceding passage before we get to 19 is setting up Christ as being the anchor promised of God that Christ would be the anchor of your soul. And I want to compare all those things that we just described, those, those fake anchors. I want to compare those to Christ himself. I want you to think about Christ and his power. Think about Christ and his power. Before the world began, before there was anything that you could see with your eyes, the Bible says out of nothing God speaks and things come into existence. If you guys ever read the Chronicles of Narnia, it's that moment when Aslan is whistling and things begin to pop up. In, in the known world at that time. That's the picture, the power of Christ to be able to speak and things come into existence. I mean, if you don't have a light switch or Alexa, you can't do anything with lights. God says, let there be light, and out of nothing comes light. The power of Christ. Think about his character, certain and sure. We see it demonstrated in this passage that something that God foretold so long ago would come to pass that God in his character being unchangeable and immovable, unshakable in his resolve to say that my people are in trouble. I will send one who will be a sure and steady anchor. That is Christ himself. 
Think about his care for you, relentless care, his mercy, his grace for you. There is no anchor that you can see with your physical eyes that can comfort you the way that Christ can comfort you. Look back at Genesis twenty-two seventeen. This is what the Bible says, describing this scene with Abraham. And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of the heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. He gives a promise to Abraham where he says, through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. And that's a promise that was made by the unchanging character of God. And what we see throughout the whole story of the Old Testament is God was bringing about this promise to be true. And that promise is found in the Lord Jesus Christ, in his life, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. Hebrews, the beginning of this passage, gives the context for the whole of the book where he talks about the prophets long ago. Listen to what he says. Long ago and at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. And what he's saying is there's nothing more sure in the whole of the world, not, not men who can predict the future and tell you what the future would be like. There's nothing more sure than Christ himself. Christ is the anchor. One of the things you need to be asking yourself, we know difficulty is going to come in life. What is it that you're clinging to that's going to hold you sure and steady. Now let's look at the adjectives in the passage. Go back to Hebrews 6, 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Two words that are very similar in their meaning. <clears throat> the second point I want to make is that the anchor of Christ is sure. The anchor of Christ is sure. This is what that word means in the New Testament. It's certain. It's firm. It's immovable. It's unwaverable. The technical definition of this word is, uh, is, it's a compound word, is to make not totter. Something that doesn't wobble, something that doesn't shake, something that is firm and certain. It is because of the faithfulness of the object. It's not because of you who cling to it. It's because of the faithfulness of the object that this anchor is sure. And how do we know it's sure? Jesus describes the reason that it's sure in John 2.19. He, he foretells his death and resurrection. John 2.19, he says this, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. The disciples had no idea what he was talking about, but he's describing something that was to come. The, the reason we know that this is a sure and steady anchor is because Christ was raised himself from the dead. Paul describes it like this in 1 Corinthians 15.19. He says, in, if in Christ... We have hope in this life only. We are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For, by, for as uh, by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, and then at his coming those who belong to Christ. This is a description, a foretelling of the certainty of the anchor that is Christ. You do reading on uh, things that are certain in life, and we would think, yes, the rotation of the earth, that's pretty certain, and we're grateful for that. We think about the, the moon in its particular place as it, uh, as it rotates around the earth and the sun. We think about the sun being sort of in a fixed place, and that seems quite certain. But the truth of the matter is, if you understand science, that uh, the only certain thing that we know about some of these details is that life is uncertain. Does that make you feel a bit wobbly? Does that make you feel a bit nervous? Whenever you contemplate something as certain as death, the Bible says it's appointed unto man wants to die and then the judgment. When you contemplate something like that, the difficulties of life or what might come at the end of life, 
Does it make you nervous? Does it, make, does it bother you inside to think about that? The beauty of the anchor of Christ is the foreshadowing of his coming. And if God was able to foretell that Christ would come, be buried, and be raised from the dead, that is only the first fruits of what we hope in, and it is as certain as anything as you sitting in this room right now that he will come again for those who are his own. The second adjective that we see is that the anchor of Christ is steadfast. The anchor of Christ is steadfast. This whole week, we're going to describe what it means to be for you to walk steadfast in the faith. Steadfastness is dependent not so much on you and your ability and you being savvy. It matters what it is that you are clinging to, the object of your faith. And this is the description here of the steadfastness of the anchor who is Christ. Steadfastness means this, sustaining one's steps moving forward, this particular word. It speaks of something which does not break down under the weight of, of life. This hope which, we, uh, which the believing soul has in the Lord Jesus is an anchor of the soul which cannot be made to totter or break when it's put under stress and strain. The result is that we have a certain hope. We have a stability in life. When other people are wavering, we have a stability in life. The truth of the matter is, is that Christ is not an Iron Man suit. Christ does not insulate you from difficulty in this life, but he promises to rescue you from all the difficulty of this life. Do you see the distinction? Even when Jesus was praying for his disciples in John 17, he doesn't pray that God would take his disciples out of the difficulties of the world. He prays that the Lord would strengthen them as they walk through the difficulties of the world. Christ is demonstrating through you and your life the sturdiness that he is for those who anchor their life in him. So even when difficulty comes, God is demonstrating the beauty of Christ, the stability of Christ through your life when other people would crumble at the difficulty and suffering and struggle in life. The fact that you cling to Christ demonstrates that he is a worthy anchor demonstrated to be steadfast and sure. The unfortunate thing is we travel down miles of roads chasing after things that Solomon calls wind. Chasing after things that we think will be fulfilling, but they're really, they're really not. The last thing that I want you to see in this passage is this. We have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters in to the inner place. The final thing I want you to see is that our anchor is secure. Our anchor is secure. I had a really fun thing that I used to do growing up. I mentioned I grew up in Florida. My dad would take me fishing a lot. And we, had, we, were not, we didn't have a lot of money, so the boat that we had was a little canoe. It's like a canoe, probably what you're going to be on on the lake uh, a little bit later today. And I remember going out, and I used to be really scared. We would go to the swamp, a lot of alligators in Florida. They don't chase you like you probably might think they do, but they don't, they don't chase you. So we were, we were fishing. And I remember one time my, I had one job. My job was to, to be the anchor guy. And so here I had the anchor. I was in the front of the boat. <clears throat> it's pretty nerve-wracking because there are gators out there. And I was a young kid, younger than you guys are in this room. And I remember thinking, man, this thing is unstable. If it turns over, like, I know what's in that water. Because we would catch catfish, and the gators would come up and try and eat the catfish. So it was like, we got to reel this sucker in fast so we could, we could get the fish, right? And so I was really sort of nervous and scared about this whole thing. And so my one job was to make sure that we, we were steady in one place and drop the anchor. And so here I am, I'm ready. My dad's doing the little kicker thing, and we're, we're rolling into this place. And so I, I, dad says, okay, it's time. This is where we want to fish. And so <clears throat> I grabbed the anchor, and I had tied the, the anchor secure on the one side. And, and so here I go, and, I, and we're sort of drifting, right? As he shuts the motor off, we're drifting. And what I see happen is I drop the anchor, and I see the rope go, and I had not tied it to the boat. And you guys have seen that look from your parents? You guys ever seen that? Like, dude, you had one job. Like, <laughs> what's your problem? Like, we, we, we did all this stuff. Like, we even did, so one of the traditions that we did as a, as a family is when we go fishing, we get Coke and peanuts. 
Like we even did Coke and Peanuts, son. What's wrong with you? Like you have one job, throw the anchor, tie it to the boat. Like the fact of the matter is, is this passage teaches very clearly that Christ is the anchor of the soul. It's the way every human being was designed to be fastened to the anchor who is Christ. And he will remain the anchor no matter what it is that we do or what it is that we cling to. But if you do not cling to him by faith, he is not your anchor. You, you will be just like that boat that tries to drop anchor and it's never secured. The, the beauty of this picture in this passage is that Christ is secure. How is it secure? Well, what we see is he goes a little bit further. He says it enters into the inner place behind the curtain or behind the veil. Turn over just very quickly to Hebrews 9, Hebrews chapter 9. This is the picture. I want you to think about it like this. Paul encourages us in Colossians chapter 3 to think on things above. We're called to walk by faith, the Bible says. That means to trust what God says, the things that we can't see, to live in life in the world that we can see. And I would encourage you in this, that if you're trusting in things to help you in life that are made with hands that you can see, you're going to be really disappointed and unhappy in life. You're going to find your life being unstable when difficulty comes. Here's the difference in Christ, Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. This is what it says. But when Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. He's, he's describing the tent of the Old Testament and what the priests had to do daily and yearly to bring the blood of bulls and goats that would satisfy the wrath of God. But it had to be done time and time and time again. The Bible says he, talking about Christ, entered once and for all into the holy place. Not a, not a tent made by human hands, but he entered into the presence of God, bearing what? The blood of the Lamb, which would satisfy the wrath of God, which would be the anchor of human souls. He entered in once and for all into the holy place, not by the means of the blood of bulls and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to do what? to serve the living God. Our anchor is secure. Why? Because Christ himself gave himself for us and he presented that sacrifice into the holy place before God. And how do we know God accepted it? Because God raised him from the dead. It is secure and it is steadfast. One final thing I want you to know. One final thing I want you to know, and I want to challenge you at the beginning of camp, that if you don't know Christ, none of this promise is for you. If you don't know Christ, you will be left in the tumult of the difficulties of the world that the Bible says are sure to come, and you will not be steady. The way the Bible describes that in Ephesians chapter 4 is you will be tossed to and fro. You have to learn to cling to Christ. Up further in the passage, he says, he says this, this is only for we who have fled for refuge. The description understands that we have reason to run, to hide, reason to run for refuge. I remember moving to Texas, being from Florida. Hurricanes, you can run from them. Tornadoes, you can't. Tornadoes happen suddenly. The night we brought our twin girls home eight years ago, we were all stacked up into a bathroom for like three and a half hours. I remember running outside. It's the most helpless I've ever felt in my life. Running outside, seeing the wind blowing as hard as I've ever seen it blow in my life. It was dark. I was unbelievably afraid because I felt helpless and hopeless. And I remember committing that night, we're going to get a tornado shelter. And so by the spring, we had a tornado shelter. It was an amazing difference when we had a place to run to for refuge. In the spring, we had tons of tornadoes. That night, by the way, there were four tornadoes within eight mile radius that touched down. I was unbelievably afraid. Every time that sort of thing happened, you hear the sirens. Once we had a place to run to, there was, no, there was no fear. There was no difficulty. We had a place to run to for refuge. Can I encourage you to take hold of Christ that way? 
When difficulty comes, don't run from him. Don't run to those things which you think will give you security and safety. Run to Christ. He's the refuge. He's the anchor that will steady your soul. It's proud men and women who refuse to yield their hearts and minds to God's word and to God's ways. Run to Christ for refuge. He is your anchor of the soul. I'll finish with this. Listen to the lyrics of this song. Christ, the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm, when the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn, in the suffering, in the sorrow, and my sinking hopes are few, I will hold fast to the anchor. It shall never be removed. Christ, the sure and steady anchor while the tempest rages on, when the temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won, deeper still then goes the anchor. Though I justly stand accused, I will hold fast to the anchor. It will never be removed. Christ, the sure and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief, hopeless somehow, oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever proved. I will hold fast to the anchor. It will never be removed. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, as we face the wave of death, when these trials give way to glory as we draw our final breath. We will cross that great horizon, clouds behind and life secure, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we endure. Christ, the sure of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true, we will hold fast to the anchor and it shall never be removed. What are you clinging to today? The difficulties that you experience far greater than I could probably comprehend. Do you need an anchor? But you don't need just any anchor. You need an anchor that is sure and steadfast. And the only anchor known to man which God has provided to be sure and steady is the Lord Jesus Christ. Cling to him. That's my prayer for you in Christ's name. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you this morning. We're so grateful for your love and kindness and wisdom toward us, your mercy and your grace that you've poured out to us. And Lord, you see the difficulty that we walk through, and, and you didn't leave us hopeless. You didn't leave us helpless. You didn't leave us to our own devices to be tossed to and fro by the tumult of the world. You gave us Christ. What a sure and steady anchor promised by an oath from you based on your character, based on your unchanging nature. And God, it is as certain as anything we've ever known in our life. Help us to cling to Christ. It's your name we pray. Amen.